This is Hector Navarro, co-host of DC Daily, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Emily of Arden D one two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode sixteen of Whelmed season three. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, character arcs, and everything else related to Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for the later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. A, B, C, D, E, F, G... Yes, yes, sir, sir. Yes, yes, sir. sir. Three, Three bags full. Q R S T U V. Like a diamond in the sky. Blah, let sheep have you and wool. How I wonder what you are. With that, let's hand it over to Emily for. Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Illusion of Control. The release date was July 2nd, 2019. The in-episode date was November 22nd. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And as always, the voice director was Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have this week Steve Bloom returning as both Henchy and Count Vertigo. Brighton James, of course, as Virgil Hawkins, Jason Marsden, Kid Flash, Eric Lopez returning as Blue Beetle, Freddie Rodriguez as Ed Dorado Jr., Um, Kelly Hu uh, is back as Paula Croc, Zeno Robinson doing not only Vic Stone, of course, but Holocaust, Lauren Tom as Tracy Thurston, a.k.a. Tracy 13, and Celia Windward, which I'll get to in the end at some (laughs) point, Uh, and... Hinden uh, Walsh back as Queen Perdita, our favorite, our favorite queen. She's the best. Just in time for your next mission. This episode opens in Taos, New Mexico, where Bart and Ed are setting up for a harvest festival at the MetaHuman Youth Center. Over in Happy Harbor, the Super Martian household is preparing for Thanksgiving dinner with the help of Forager, while Vic sulks out in the RV. The Wen Harper Croc household is also preparing for Thanksgiving dinner with a side of awkwardness it's fine it'll be fine (laughs) i don't know if i've ever seen a thanksgiving episode that didn't have a side of awkwardness maybe maybe a little maybe uh and dr helga jace is examining that hairbrush in a totally not evil scientist kind of way it's a totally normal scientist way of looking at the situation And after the credits, we see Garfield and Perdita arrive in Taos to meet up with the rest of the team, minus Cassie, much to the annoyance of Virgil. (laughs) He just wants his best friend there. He's very bored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is bored the word? He's annoyed. He's more annoyed than anything else. Seventh wheel. He wants a buddy. (laughs) He wants to not be in a bumper car by himself. Back in Star City, Violet is very on edge because she still hasn't told anyone that her memories are coming back and that she feels in some way responsible for the death of her boyfriend's parents. <laughs> and while she's having her mini crisis, Jace arrives to make everything worse. In Happy Harbor, Forager tries to reach out to Victor, but Vic isn't in the mood for friendship at the moment with humans or aliens. Back in Taos, everyone's having a great time playing bumper cars, except Virgil, who just wants a girlfriend. And Ed explains <laughs> that Wendy, the Metatine situation to Queen Perdita, who decides to be super awesome. I just love Queen Perdita. Gosh, She's I love best. Queen Perdita. <laughs> I really do too. She's amazing. I love how she just busts out some Spanish with it's just so good. Ed and Gar also discuss their desire to inspire other Metakids, something that they can't do on a secret covert special ops team. 
However, Gar's heroic speech is interrupted by everyone in the area being incapacitated by someone who appears to be Count Vertigo. We'll get to that appears to be a little later. Uh, Vertigo then kidnaps Perdita and escapes in a helicopter, but is quickly followed by the team. They chase the villains into the desert, but have to follow at a distance because of Vertigo's powers. Back in Happy Harbor, Forager tries to reach out to Vic again, reminding him that he has a lot of friends who care about him and want to help him. And he even throws in a nice little metamorphosis metaphor in there. However, Vic sadly turns him down again. Forge is out here comparing him to butterflies, and Vic doesn't have time for any of it. Gosh. I have no time for your bug nonsense. Be nice to Fred Bug. Yeah. He's a good boy. You know, back in Star City, everyone's having a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner until Jace brings up the fact that Artemis is doing work with the team again as Tigress, and Paula loses it and storms out of the kitchen. <laughs> oh, Jace. <laughs> She and Artemis have a heated argument in the hallway where Artemis argues that being a hero brings her joy and fulfillment and purpose, while her mother insists that it's too dangerous, she needs to choose a normal life instead, and that she should start dating her (laughs) brother-in-law. That conversation doesn't go well. But back in Taos, Tracy 13 forces Vertigo's helicopter to land as the team pursues. However, once inside this Pueblo structure, the group can't find Perdita anywhere and keeps getting lost. The team eventually realizes that they're being tricked by mental illusions, even though Vertigo doesn't have that power. And Gar comes up with the solution to use his superhuman bear senses of smell to track her down. It's quite a clever use of shapeshifting, actually. Yes. However, on their way, they're intercepted by Henchy, who appears far stronger than he should be. Meanwhile, Vertigo's momentary concern for his henchmen allows uh, Perdita the chance to attack him, and the hit disrupts his concentration enough that his illusion drops and he is revealed to be none other than Simon. And Henchy turns out to be Devastation, his girlfriend, because that's the thing I have to say about this show. <laughs> The team follows her back to where Simon is keeping Perdita, but the supervillains escape into the night. The revelation that Simon and Devastation, two members of Queen Bee's task force known as Onslaught, are behind this makes the team realize that Perdita's kidnapping was just a distraction. The rest of Onslaught is back at the festival re-kidnapping all the Metateens that were rescued from Bialya. However, the team arrives in time to prevent the kidnapping and take down Onslaught. Back in Star City, Violet has a bit of a breakdown and runs out of the kitchen. <laughs> the dog should not be taking bribes. Jace follows after her and Violet tells Jace everything. A revelation which Jace tells her they can keep as a secret between them. Just the two of them. Nope. Jace then immediately calls someone she hasn't spoke to in a long time to ask for their help. To round out the episode, Victor finally decides to join everyone for Friendsgiving. Much to the delight of Forager, Ann and Taos, Blue Beetle, Beast Boy, and Kid Flash decide to go public with their superheroics in an attempt to start inspiring other teens. All right, let's go into the details here. Let's feel some master. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Cool. So, starting this episode off, at the very beginning, I... I don't know how many times I've watched this episode, but I think it finally clicked this time around. It absolutely looks like Bart kisses Ed on the cheek during that first scene when they're like rounding everybody up. And I know it's like it's quick hugs for everybody. And then he's got his arm around Ed for the rest of that scene. And like, I get it. It's never been confirmed in show. But like, I'm I'm taking I'm taking animation as confirmation. (laughs) Like if the dialogue has not told me, I'm just accepting it. They're cute. I like they're dating. They're dating. The more I watch it, like the <laughs> seventh, they're dating. They're done. I'm done with this pretense. <laughs> I mean, it, the first time I watched it, the seventh wheel thing, I didn't catch it because you have to like do a bunch of math, and I didn't, couldn't remember who was in the scene and what was happening. Uh, and then as soon as somebody pointed it out, I was looking at it and I was like, "Oh yeah, maybe, maybe it might be." Yeah. And after watching it so many times now, I'm just like, "Yeah, uh, absolutely. They're absolutely dating. <laughs> Good for them. Good for them." <laughs> Good for those kids. Them. Um, Bart, needs, Bart needs to figure out how to run 10 feet without eating all the food, though. 
It's such a short distance. Buddy, oh. you're going to bring some cotton candy to your boyfriend. You better get it done. Relationship advice for superheroes. <laughs> So this is another random little thing from all this with the whole seventh wheel joke. I really like that this is another episode with this little little through line about how like Cassie and Virgil are actually really close friends. Like we've never had them like sit down and tell us that. They just keep putting in these little things about how like they have like they like do like fist bumps and stuff and it's very cute. And I like in this that he's just like, Where's Where's Cassie? Where's my friend? Can I have one friend who's not dating someone in this group, please? But no, she's trying to work things out with her boyfriend in Gotham because her boyfriend's made bad choices. Yeah, Cam. It's not Cam's fault that Tim makes dumb choices. That's Tim's fault. Sorry. (laughs) But, uh... Random other things. I know we've a lot of the stuff we've mentioned in our Scream Something, but the little nursery rhyme remix from season one coming back with Leon. Uh, my heart, it hurts. It's very cute. Apparently, this is a, a croc family tradition of just mixing every nursery rhyme you can think of into one song. Uh, yeah. And I never know whether to laugh or cry about it. <laughs> it feels like it was kind of a... I don't, I don't know how to deal with this thing. Like both this and Artemis calling Leon baby girl. I have a whole note about that for next episode because I don't know what to do with the baby girl thing either. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it seems to me, this is what it seems to me like. This is all headcanon. Of course. I mean, Sportsmaster and Paula were terrible parents. <laughs> Just terrible. To the point where they didn't even know how to sing a freaking nursery rhyme to them, to their kids. And so it was a mangled mess when they were younger and they didn't know. And now Artemis has owned it. She's just owning it. Because that scene where she sings it at the very beginning of in, in um, Misplaced, that's clearly an accident. Like she's clearly like not knowing the nursery rhymes or whatever. But like, is that the way her mom sang it? Sung it to her, and is it is it does it have a positive memory for her, or is she just owning, trying to own these things and and change the energy around what these things represent? So I will, I will say, I think straight up calling Paula a horrible parent is a little harsh because part of Paula's whole thing is that she was absent from Artemis's life for a very long time, not of her own free will. I hear what you're saying, but. That was six. She was six years. It was six years. Okay. So Artemis was sixteen, which means that Artemis was nine or ten when it happened. And this 15. is a nursery rhyme from childhood. All right. So fifteen. So nine when it okay. happened. This is a nursery rhyme from childhood, is what I'm saying. So, and I think even Paula Fair. is saying is saying things like, "This is awful. Like I, I did not do what I should have done." And she's trying to make up for it in her in like kind of in her quote-unquote defense like she's trying to make up for it and trying but she'll keep saying stuff like like oh my my daughter makes a great table could use some salt you know just stuff like that like she's trying she is she is trying but i don't know i don't know anyway but i mean i hear you i hear you when there's when there's a negative association with a thing you have two choices you either just let it go and just don't reference it anymore and kind of remove it from your story or you own it and change the energy around it you know and try and make it into something more positive and you know it, that may be what artemis is trying to do i don't know i can also with the i have it written in my notes for next episode but we can talk about it now because it happens here too the with the whole calling leon baby girl thing i think part of it might just be a reflex like it she heard it so much growing up that she, being presented with a small child who is related to her just kind of instinctually she's like oh this is what i call this child and then maybe later had yeah. kind of like looked back on it and was like hmm weird that's the thing my dad calls me and then just kind of unpacking that for herself <laughs> i know i have said things i've said things and then looked at people and go like uh that you just met my dad that was my dad <laughs> like this phrase came right out of my mouth and it's a, like a phrase or a term or something that I don't, not negative, but like I don't necessarily have a positive association with it. It's just like, oh, this is a thing my dad said. 
you know, all the time. And now I'm saying it and I'm just like, okay, what? You know, sometimes we become our parents. On that note. <laughs> Got a lot of psychology in this episode for some reason. Have I mentioned recently that I love Queen Perdita? Because I love Queen Perdita. <laughs> Did we say it enough during the episode breakdown? Hard same. It's, it's true. Hard same. Gosh, I love Queen Perdita. I uh, do too. And Trust we, me, it's noted. I'd say it in every episode she's in this season, but she's fabulous. And I love that she's a good diplomat and a good friend and an awesome girlfriend. And she speaks Spanish and she cares about other people. And she she punched Simon in the face. She punched a oh, supervillain yeah. in the face. Oh, yeah. And she has no powers and probably only a minimum amount of training. But she <laughs> punched him in the face. I feel like when your uncle's vertigo... And you, you just, you, that's got to be building up in you, you know, because you can't get close enough to Vertigo to punch him in the face. He's going to stop you from doing it. It's like, oh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> and I absolutely believe Queen Perdita has some level of combat training. She was like, no, oh, no. for sure. No, no, I need, to, I need to know how to defend myself. And I'm just, I love it. I love her. Yeah. Gosh, I love Queen Perdita. <laughs> Queen Perdita appreciation squad right here. Yeah. I have a whole thing going on in my head now of like, so that now you're now everybody's living in a world full of metahumans, right? And when you have a ruler of another country, and we've literally seen rulers of other countries <laughs> being mind controlled by super villains, and now you have a whole world full of stuff. I'm just like, I wonder if like, I wonder if McGann can put some psychic blocks into her mind or train her so that she can do like defend herself against things like that. I don't know. I've got like a whole like subplot going on right now with Queen Perdita as, you know, like in her, in her late twenties and somebody trying to Jedi mind trick her. And she's like, yeah, mm. my, my sister in law is <laughs> exactly my sister in law is a Martian. Have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Based on based on all of the other things that I read and watch that contain telepathy, I absolutely believe that's a thing. So mm -hmm. yes, I support this. I'm in. Queen, it's Queen Perdita, Perdita needs to be Queen, more awesome. Fact, so just <laughs> as a side note, I think it's hilarious that Queen Perdita, the teenage queen of an entire country, is the quote unquote normal one in a in an extended family of superheroes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> My boyfriend can turn into any animal he's ever seen. My sister-in-law <laughs> is a Martian telepath shapeshifter. Uh, my brother-in-law is a half-Kryptonian half clone <laughs> right. of Superman and Lex <laughs> Luthor. And I'm the normal one. The queen of an entire country. The right. normal one. Yeah. It's got to... I mean, she's going to be the best diplomat in the world. She's like, yes. there's nothing you can do to surprise me <laughs> right now. Gosh, I love it. But speaking of all of this, in the midst of all this stuff, have we talked about Perdita's this is for the murder of my father line? Like, like, did we know that already? Did we know this already? Because when she goes to attack Count Vertigo, she shouts, this is for the murder of my father. And I'm like, so we we knew that her parents were dead because that's why she's a queen in season one when she's like nine but what? I did not catch that. Hi, I caught this line this time. Uh, <laughs> but I feel like I feel like if you didn't catch no. this and we didn't know, I feel like no. I think that's new information. I feel like wow. yeah. Well, like we knew we knew her dad had to be dead because that's how right. Yeah, <laughs> that's how a line of succession that's, works. Right. Exactly. Um. But I think this is the first time we've had confirmation that Vertigo is responsible for that. And I just it clicked this time through because so much happens in this episode. But there you go. it's very cool. I like it. Hello, my name so, is Queen Perdita. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> when I was making reference earlier to that's got to you have your uncle's Vertigo. It's got to build up in you. I did not know. I didn't catch that line. So, Yeah. That's a line that she says. Yeah. One more check mark on the wow, Queen Perdita's really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Fully checklist. breaks Simon's nose too. Just breaks his nose. She lays Simon uh, out because she out. doesn't even just punch him in the face. She breaks his nose and he falls to the ground. That's like, right. This is a tiny little fifteen-year-old girl 
who just like knocked a super villain to the ground. And I, I, I love mean, it. In Simon's defense, you know, love makes you do crazy things. Rich. <laughs> I will turn this podcast so- around. <laughs> <laughs> he was so worried about devastation. My love. <laughs> hey, I'm just pointing out what happened. That's what happened. I don't even want to mention my next note de- now because I don't want to go down this I, I, I was trying hole. to give you a handoff to Ugh, your next note, but fine, I tell you. <laughs> fine. <laughs> so on this whatever millionth time rewatch of this episode... I finally noticed the fact that uh, Devastation as Henshi, when they first show up being Count Vertigo and kidnapping Perdita and confusing everyone, uh, laughs while saying the line, lead the way, boss. And yes, the closed captions do put quotation marks around the word boss just to emphasize oh, yeah? this. Yeah. <laughs> I had closed captions on while I was taking notes, um, <laughs> which just acts as a nice little... Uh, in retrospect, sign that they're not who they appear to be. Like, Devastation's barely keeping it together. Apparently, she thinks this is just hilarious. Uh, right. And I, I, think it's, I think it's funny, looking back on. And we're not going to talk about them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to but, think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> but speaking of all of this, uh, sort of, maybe, I think it's hilarious that Scarab is just a little bit jealous of Tracy 13. <laughs> <laughs> Scarab seems vaguely annoyed that anyone else has Jaime's attention, and it's very funny. There's just no satisfying you. <laughs> when she takes down the helicopter, and the Scarab's just like, "I could have done that. I could have done. I, c- I could have done it too. I'm t- I'm as I'm as cool as her, and I could have done it." <laughs> and it's just like, no, you gotta you gotta reassure your alien bug parasite friend. <laughs> That he is not any less important in your life now that you have a romantic <laughs> partner. Important superhero advice, superhero romance advice from Emily. You got to reassure <laughs> the parasitic robot uh, attached to your back that it is still an important part of your life no matter who you are dating. He's feeling underappreciated. Is there enough there for his super sweethearts? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, I, I do love how Scarab, he's like, I'm going to recommend a precision attack to murder this person specifically. <laughs> he was like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? You do not get the through line here. There's no satisfying you. <laughs> it would help if you mentioned that we didn't want to kill Queen Perdita <laughs> earlier. And right. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's implied. <laughs> She's right. our friend. <laughs> right. We don't do things that murder right. our friends. Uh, uh, and in the tradition of young justice, uh, we've got uh, we've got uh, Mr. Bloom having conversations with himself in a relationship, apparently, sort of in a weird way, and uh, Eric Lopez <laughs> arguing with himself. A lot of arguing with him- ourselves in this show. Yep. Looking at you, Zara. <laughs> uh, speaking of Zara, I one, I love Leon in this episode. She's precious, and Zara is the is the voice of Leon, and I love it. Yeah. But just to point out for one second, after after Jace goes off and reveals Artemis's secret hero life and uh Paula gets real mad about it and everybody storms out of the kitchen, they cut to Leon for a second and just goes, Whoops. And one, it's very adorable. But I would like to point out that this child knows not to talk about this stuff in front of Paula, Jace, and you can't manage it because you're the worst. <laughs> When a child is more able to read social cues and understand what is and isn't appropriate to mention in this context, Jace, Jace, (laughs) did you know I don't trust or like Jace? No, I do not trust or like, I do not trust or like Jace either. And I'm not crashing any modes. I already didn't trust her at this point in the series. (laughs) Yes. I'm just saying. Uh, In her defense... I hate to even use that phrase. No, there's no defending this woman. She doesn't know. She doesn't know their dynamic. She doesn't know their history. 
She doesn't know a lot about the family things going on. She probably doesn't even, I don't even know if she knows Paula's, I don't know, former criminal or whatever. Well, she shouldn't have she, assumed. She shouldn't have assumed. What she shouldn't have assumed was that Artemis wasn't keeping her superhero life separate as a secret identity with her mom. <laughs> like, secret identities are a thing, Jace. Like, that's a thing that she Jace. does not, yeah, for sure. Like, <sighs> all right, let's move away from her. Fine. What's next? So, let's talk about that hallway scene. That hallway scene. We have talked this hallway scene to death and back. <laughs> yes. So many times. Check out our Scream Something for a very eloquent, longer breakdown of this scene and my feelings about everything involved in this. Yeah. But Or the didn't you talk about the DC Daily too? A little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. A little bit um, in the DC Daily episode we were on. Because DC Daily is wonderful, but I can't go off for 15 minutes about it. <laughs> <laughs> Where I scream something, I'm pretty sure we went off for 15 minutes I talking about this hallway scene back chunk. and forth for a while. Yeah, for sure. Because I was confused. Yes. The long and short of that is, even at this point in the series, Will and Artemis don't have those feelings for each other. They are just being pressured by everyone in their lives to act on something they don't feel and both think that maybe it would be easier if they were in a relationship because that's what people are telling them they're supposed to feel in this situation, even if it's not what either of them actually want. And Paul is just contributing to that. That's the long and short of that. If you want a 15-minute breakdown of everything I mean by that, go listen to Scream <laughs> Something. But on this watch through... I was thinking a lot about the fact that with this hallway scene, Paula is making a decent point in a not great way, but a decent point for a large part of this conversation. Yeah. She's just going about it in the completely wrong way, like saying, oh, you are in a dangerous profession that makes me worried for your livelihood and you have been hurt by this before. Is a yes. f fine and dandy thing for a parent to say to their child when worried yeah. about their thing. Just the fact that she goes about it in the completely wrong way and brings up like 10 million things that are very much like very, very sensitive topics for Artemis and just kind of throws them at her. And then out of nowhere says, oh, also, you should be dating your brother-in-law. <laughs> and at that point, we just her whole argument changes course and loses all credibility the second that she's like, you know, it'll yep. solve your life. A man and not just any man, your brother-in-law. Yeah. No. The, er the early, speaking of the early parts of that argument, she's basically giving Artemis the same speech that Artemis and Dick and Connor gave the new kids on the block on the beach. That you do not have to be fighting supervillains to be in the life. You do not have to be on the front lines. There are people that have been part of the team that have left the team to do other things and you don't have to be a part of the life. She's literally the speech that Artemis gave on the beach. And so I'm listening and I'm going like, yeah. And Artemis, I mean, Artemis gets to make her own choices. I get it. But like, you're right. I, I think the fact that Paula knows that she's right in this circumstance, like, I mean, she thinks she's right in every circumstance. But in this case, I think that she is, has a valid point makes her feel like I always have valid points. All my points are valid. Also date your boy, date your brother-in-law. Like it becomes a challenge. And yeah, I agree with you. She had a good point. Artemis. I think the, I think the real difference kind of boils down to with the difference between Paula talking to Artemis and that scene on the beach with all of them is that the scene on the beach, despite the fact that they are talking to children, they are respecting those children's decision and their agency to make that decision. And they are all speaking very calmly and explaining all of this, even though this is a complex emotional decision for everyone involved. Yeah. And that when all of them say, this is what I want to do, or this is not what I want to do, they all go, okay, that is your choice. We will support you in doing that. Whereas yeah. Paula goes, I see that you have made a choice. I disagree with that choice. And I will yell at you about making that choice until you make the choice that I think is right. And I'm like, no, yeah. no, oh, no. Oh, gosh. So here's the thing I just thought of, too. Please share. Paula has been able to, in the past, 
I was going to say manipulate. That's not the right word. She's been able to influence Artemis with her emotion. Yeah. Her emotional state. Oh, now, God, yeah. Back in downtime, <laughs> albeit now that we know some of the timeline, how the timeline works, Paula had not been back very long. She'd just gotten out of jail, right? Um, Artemis got this offer to go to Gotham Academy, and she, wasn't, she didn't want to go. And her mom made an impassioned speech that I think was a really solid one. And I think maybe Paula is now like that worked. You know what I mean? Like has that example of something like that working and she's doing the same thing. Cause it's basically the same speech. I don't want you in the life. It's the same kind of speech, except this time she's yelling and being mad and angry about it. And I kind of understand that part, you know, why are you making this choice when all of these things have gone horribly wrong for you? And it's been two years and you still haven't recovered from one of the things, that, just one of the things that happened. You got to move on and do something else, you know? Yep. Paula, you're complicated. Wow. Who would have guessed? But yeah, I had never, I had never made that connection back to downtime, but you are absolutely right. This is very, very similar to that, just in a much, much larger scale and a much bigger problem. Yeah. Wow. But... I that is that's basically all of all of my stuff, but I'm sure you have some things to to add to all of that to end on to end on that hallway scene. <laughs> yeah, I don't think my stuff to add because I, of course, as usual, you make great points, and I'm folding a lot of my points into your <laughs> points. We might not end on the hallway scene, but the other thing that I was watching very closely this time is you know Jace and this bribery revelation you know she the first reaction jace has is you know brian would understand you know like she really does kind of lean into supporting her you know and it's one of those scenes where it's like as much as we don't trust her in any way i look at this and i'm just like Mm, this is why our feelings were not clear. This is the writers walking this line, you know, between like, uh, okay, she seems she's super sketchy and our hearts are <laughs> it's just shaking her head and screaming in silence. No, I'm putting something yeah. in crashing the mode because you said something and it made me think of something and I can't say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have more to say in Crash in the Mode too, but it's something it's something to be to be noted. Um there's a couple other points too. I think I already made my Ed and Bar point <laughs> earlier on. They're absolutely dating. That's a thing. I whatever is going on there. And then in our Scream Something I did mention, of course, that Steve Bloom voices he's everywhere. He's like in every animated series I've ever seen, seems like Steve Bloom pops up. Uh, but he plays in Star Wars Rebel Zeb Aurelius, who's one of the main characters from Rebels. And Zeb's personal exclamation, I don't know if it's a curse word, maybe, uh, is Carabast. Greg has told us that uh, that word is a word that he created when he was working on on Rebels. And so he wrote it, he actually wrote it, I think in our stream something, I was like, was this random? Did C. Bloom just say this and they left it in or what's going on? Greg has said to us, no, that wasn't actually in the script. It was it was supposed to be a, a fun nod back to Zeb, uh, which I think is really, really cool. And we have some things with Neil. Mm, Timestamp of 1600 and happy hour. I got our 16. Oh, yeah. The, he said, love the season one callback to McGann and Connor cooking, which I did catch. And I didn't put that in my notes where she actually takes a giant amount of things out of the refrigerator again. But this time he actually knows what's happening. and It doesn't get dumped on his head. Connor is prepared. He's ready to go. He's like, gosh, no, it's been... cute. <laughs> he does it so he'll stop looking at his phone. And it's cute. Yeah. And it's cute. <laughs> yeah. Neil says, Jace has done nothing wrong yet. You two dial it back. The mixed nursery rhymes is so good. Call back to season one. Shows a relationship Artemis had with her mom and the, uh, and the one her mom now has with Leon. So good. Very asterisk is an awesome twist on a classic. That's another thing. I, I agree with Neil on this. Like the way that, because this happens with, it happens with my friends, you know, like 
we make inside jokes and references to things, right? And things evolve over time to the point of being completely, completely unrecognizable to anybody else, right? Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Sorry, I don't understand this next one. I think that might have been a reference to... to n- n- nope, we're not... Nope. I think it's another joke about Simon and Devastation. Oh, yes. And okay. no, no, we right. can't include yep. it because yep. we don't nope, have the rest of the context. Nope. We can't yep. include it. Rich, yep. Yep. Rich. So <laughs> we're making some speculation here. You can't make assumptions here about Niels. About a note that Neil put in. I think there was a typo here. Um, we're, we're pretty sure what Neil meant here was he was talking about the big uh, Devastation Simon reveal. Um the, the sentence reads, instead, <clears throat> it's our favorite couple is a lot of fun. Uh, so, yes, I knew that Emily has left the show. She just literally tore her headset off and stormed out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. She came back. I, nice. I didn't even leave. I didn't even leave the frame, guys. I couldn't yeah. commit to that bit. Oh, you were technically out of the frame. Technically. <laughs> Uh, oh, all right, we'll move sorry, on. Sorry, I'm next never going to be over the fact that this is a thing on this show. <laughs> I love and it. That y'all won't let it go. No, Neil and I agree on this. Let thing. me live in peace. <laughs> let them live in peace, Emily. They can live in peace just <laughs> fine. People need to stop yelling at me about how I need to talk about it. <laughs> uh, the next thing he says is. Jace's lack of reaction when Halo reveals that she let the assassin in is, of course, concerning. But then she immediately seeks out assistance from her mentor to try and help out. All on the up and up, he says. <laughs> and he's got another note here, which, uh, which is a crash in the mode. He's got marked as a crash in the mode moment. <laughs> so we will move that right down here into crashing the mode. Let's head into uh, a mid-roll. Uh, then we'll come back with a canary debrief. Some fan service and crashing the mode. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid roll. This week we have two new uh, five star reviews. They're short, and when I say new, it means new to us reading it <laughs> because we are a little behind. Uh, these uh, reviews were posted uh, six to eight weeks ago. <laughs> we appreciate that, but we can only do one or two at a time. Uh, some of them have been amazingly long and detailed, and we really appreciate that. It's really kind when new people find the show. Having that kind of detail is is incredible. So the first one we have is called Great Podcast by DC DC is Greater Than Marvel. You guys are great. Young Justice is one of my favorite shows, and all the references and 16s, not Daniil, you find always blow my mind. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And the second one we have is A Labor of Love by Unique Exemplar. Rich and Emily catch more than I ever could. Their episode deep dives teach me more about this show and all related content every time. Though this podcast is focused on the DC animated series Young Justice, Rich, Emily, and their guests explore much more than that. I've heard more about the DC universe and storytelling thanks to their passion. Huge thank you to both DC, DC Greater Than Marvel, and Unique Exemplar for their kind words. If you love a podcast or a novel, movie, game, comic, or any other creative endeavor, please consider taking a few minutes to rate and review it or share what you love about it on social media and tag the creators. If just 10% of the people who love to work reviewed it, that work would shoot up to the top of their search engines and give those creators much more exposure. It's a wonderful gift, and we here at Whelmed are grateful for everyone. Thank you. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. I wanted to talk today about something we see in not just a lot of Young Justice episodes, but across all media. We've mentioned it a lot within the reviews, but I don't think we've taken the time to talk about it in a debrief, and that's the balance of physical action with relational action. Illusion of Control is a good example of this. I'm honestly not sure which is the A plot and which is the B plot, (laughs) which which is a good thing. Having a holiday episode can, of course, be emotional. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure there's ever been a holiday special in a TV series that wasn't emotional in some way. But the relational action can get intense, both with Vic and Forger and with Paula and Artemis. Moving back and forth from the Season 2 team chasing Perdita's kidnappers to the emotional punches is a relief for both plot lines. 
When your protagonists are in an intense scene or a chapter, it's important to give your reader or watcher a chance to breathe, to process what happened, even if it, what happened in that processing is subconscious. Even though there's a lot happening in this episode, the action gives us a moment to breathe from the intense personal drama and the quiet time at home, <laughs> creating, you know, creating food for a Thanksgiving dinner gives us a break from that intense chase. It also lets the writers move that chase forward in time so we aren't just watching Ed teleport over and over and over again for miles. You may not want to give your reader or watcher an emotional breather, and that's okay. I encourage you to know when you're doing that, though, and to do it with intention. It can be easy to forget when you're writing a script or a novel over many months or even years what the pacing is like for someone sitting down to read or watch the story you're so familiar with uh, over hours or you know a few days. Giving that downtime to process can help build long-term suspense and keep your reader engaged without burning them out emotionally. And so now let's head into some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. If there's a fan creator that you love who's making family-friendly art, music, videos, AMVs, comics, cosplay, or anything else related to Young Justice or DC Comics, please send us a link at the YJ Files on Twitter or at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. This week, we have an AMV from our recent guest, Shane Lee Samboy. It's a tribute to Zeno Robinson and Victor Stone. It cuts together scenes of Vic in Season 3 with the song Monster from Imagine Dragons, and it's... It's pretty great. Uh, the timing that Shane Lee puts into some of the scenes with the lyrics is fantastic. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Thanks, Shane Lee. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original storylines that may affect what we see later on. We also may drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. If you are spoiler wary, this is your warning. Let's go back to talking about Jace. Yeah, because she is such a great lady who we enjoy. She so says, much. "Oh, maybe Brion would be okay with this," and I'm yes. like, "I'm like, whoa." Yeah. As you were talking, I put in a note that I realize is the same note you made. Yeah. Oh, it's the same note yeah, I made? Oh, Basically. yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So read that, your note, and, and then that, I can read my note, which is just all the, caps version of your note. My note says, the way Jay says, I'm sure Brion would understand. I'm not sure what that is. Does she want Gabrielle to tell him so he'd be horrified? I mean, Jace already knew that Gabrielle did, the, did that, right? Because, I mean, maybe? I mean, I guess it's possible she didn't know, but she seems to have known everything that she's been doing from the very beginning. So... My suspicion is she'd be like, where'd this kid come from? And they'd be like, oh, this is the kid that let us in and there was supposed to be no, so we might as well experiment on her. Oh, okay, great. She knew from the very beginning what the yes. situation was, not that she was just some random kid. So that's why she wasn't reacting, like Neil was saying. Uh... Yep. Uh, and my <sighs> all caps note that I made while you were referencing this earlier just says, in all capital letters, Jace doesn't suggest keeping it a secret until Halo does. She was absolutely going to push her to get Brion to reject her. And ah, yes. And so, the way that and the way they put this yeah. in the scene, it becomes a thing that threw me off guard about her. It ends up being exactly as horrible as it as all of her actions are. Yep. But. Somehow they phrased it and they framed it in a way where I'm looking at it going like, oh, she was trying to be helpful and encourage her to talk to Brion and Brion might understand and maybe not. I don't know, but she's maybe that's just something that you say on reflex when you're trying to make somebody feel better as well. And like there was a lot going on in just those one words, the carefully placed words, like being in the head of someone and, and understanding from the very beginning so that you can lay the groundwork for stuff like this is is why Young Justice throws us off and uh, and obviously we enjoy the show, right? Yes, we critique the show. There's there's things to critique, but there's a reason why we keep doing this every week for years. And this is one of those things. Other... I was looking to see if... Oh, I was just looking to see if Neil's crashing the, the mode note was about 
Jace, but it's not. Uh, my other thing about uh, Jace, real quick, is her looking back on it. Her "You're not Gabrielle, you're Violet" line sounds way more threatening when you realize how much Jace genuinely just despises the abomination that she views Violet to be. Because that's not just her. Re- that's not her reassuring Violet that it's like, oh, you aren't the person who hurt them and hurt that family no yeah that's jace reassuring herself that it doesn't matter if she hurts or destroys this person because this person isn't a person to isn't her anymore person. no yep no, yeah yeah yep yep i still keep forgetting to look for this thing this other note that you had i still haven't seen it i don't know why uh- <laughs> My other note, on a much happier note, Mal and Karen are at the Super Martian Friendsgiving event. I keep forgetting to look for them, and I because I, I I see at the beginning of the episode I'm watching, and I'm going like I don't see Mal and Karen here, and and I saw some scene where I think they were when they were sitting down and having the argument. Actually, I was kind of scanning, and I was like, I don't, I, I just didn't see them, but I was still focused on the like the words of the argument that were intense. But like, no, they're at, they're at the Super Martian one. They're not what. What are you talking about? Oh, they're at the Super Martian one. Yeah. Wait. They're not they're not at the Wen Harper Croc household. They're at the Super That's, Martian and Thank you. It is Snapper Car household. Which is where Cuz they're all Vic happy. Harper, there's kids. too many Thanksgivings going on. I'm getting them all mashed together in my head. No, there's happening. just enough Thanksgivings. <laughs> There's exactly enough. enough Thanksgivings. Not enough Thanksgivings. Not enough Thanksgivings. Okay. Where's everyone else? <laughs> That's fair. What's Zatanna doing for Thanksgiving? Answer me that. Where's my Bat Fam fa- Thanksgiving? That's right. Oh, Bat Fam Thanksgiving. Chaos. Now I, truly. I didn't know that I needed that. I need that. It's just a, it's it's Bruce Wayne and then like twenty Robins. <laughs> twenty Robins and Batgirls. And it's crashed by Condiment King. <laughs> That'd be awesome. No, let, let Batman have one normal night. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not possible. But yes, Mal and Karen are at the Super Martian household Super Martian for one. Thanksgiving. There you go. There you go. It's very cute. All the happy Harbor kids getting back together. <laughs> Nod to the wiki. I got confused uh, when I was writing up the first time I think in the scream something I mentioned this I was confused about who is Celia Windward, and I think I was getting confused between like with that last name of Windward being Wendy, <laughs> right? And so I I think my brain just kind of ran over that a little bit, and so then I'm like, well, there's this there's this girl talking to to Static at the end. Who is that? And I'm like looking through, and I kept seeing. Celia Windward and I was like but that's Wendy and then I looked and finally I realized wait no they're two different people who is this <laughs> and I, so I went to the wiki not to the YJ wiki I'm like I do not know that name at all I have no idea who this person is and she sounds like she's got like a Dominican Republic Jamaican Haitian something you know like some kind of accent yeah. uh, so I went to the wiki had a link and I clicked on it she's apparently a metahuman from the comics named Jet who can control electromagnetic forces. So I find that interesting that the whole episode is talking about how he needs a girlfriend. (laughs) Celia shows up, talks about how hot the superhero boys are or whatever. And she has that's her line. Yeah, that's her line. That's literally her line. And she can control electromagnetic forces along with static. And I was like, all right, even if they don't date, that I want to see their powers like on a mission, like doing s- interesting things together. That would be super cool. Yeah, what I find interesting, and there's like a whole. I didn't. I didn't get through all of it. I actually went to the. I went to um, the Wikipedia entry for Jet. There's a whole thing. Something about her, the original character being created by the Guardians, <laughs> like like the Guardians of Oa, who created the Green Lantern Corps, who are looking for the next basically generation of Guardians. Uh, so they go to Earth and they take uh, like a dozen humans and give like uplift them with these metahuman powers and Jet's one of them. I'm like, I none of I know none of this storyline. <laughs> this is and the artwork looks like it's probably I'm guessing from around the 70s or 80s. I'm guessing from just the artwork cuts that they have of this Jet. So 
Anyway, there's a whole thing going on with her. I don't. I didn't even know. So, thank you, YJ Wiki, for helping us out on that one. To briefly cut to Emily's superhero love life advice column: Don't in the superhero world, don't date people just because they have the same powers as you. No, that's not a good plan. No. Date people who have powers that are compatible with yours. It's a different. It's a different thing. And it's important <laughs> to understand when choosing a romantic partner <coughs> or. A crime fighting partner within the superhero world. This has been <laughs> this has been Dear Emily, the superhero love life advice column. I need more of that. I need <laughs> that entire thing to be a thing. All of that needs to needs to happen. Just add it to the list of ten million projects. <laughs> like every every project I've ever been a part of, it starts as an internet joke. That was awesome. Whenever this is this is Neil's note. Whenever Victor looks off into the distance, I can't help but think he's becoming the information highway. How many times do we see Jace make a phone call in this season? Exactly zero, except this episode. She texts every other episode. And I am curious about Oh shoot. See, this is me mixing up the things again okay so, oh man so i was thinking like if vic's at if vic's at the thanksgiving dinner and he's there looking off into the information super highway and they have jace texting and he he already knows that he can watch people's text messages go by i was thinking like oh i was thinking like oh that's why she made the phone call because he could see the texts nope i gotta take my tin hat off bummer because he wasn't at that thanksgiving right no He's at the other. He's at the Super Martian Thanksgiving. I was like trying to keep up with. It and, I know, like, and it wasn't track working. Of what theory you were trying to put together here? Because I was like, I'm not sure where Rich is going. No, I'm really no. not sure. That was tin hat garbage. I just threw out at you guys. Garbage. Now I want to go back and see if Victor's if Vic's ever in the room when she's making a text message when she's texting someone. She he is, but he's in a coma. Ah. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Nice. I hand my tin hat to Emily. Well done. I yeah, that's a good one. It. That's a good one. She like <laughs> I love she like covers up the text message, but then Vic's like, "What?" Yeah, he was awake. Excuse me. It's fine. It's fine. Why is there a this picture of the ultra humanite on your text messages? And it might have been a call, but whatever. Yeah. I feel like he could probably intercept calls by accident too. It's all probably. technology. I feel like that would. What I feel like happens is what we see happening with Oracle in the HUDs with him. Like, really? he's just seeing stuff. Or like, um, did you see the most recent um, Spider-Man movie, Far From Home? I didn't. You haven't seen it? I haven't seen it. It's fine. You can tell me this thing. Well, there's a, there's a scene, like, Peter's wearing a piece of technology yeah. uh, and, and glasses, and he's... Uh, he can he looks around the bus and he realizes that this this uh, pair of glasses he's wearing lets him read everyone's text messages as they're texting on the bus and the text messages are really interesting like the one with flash texting to his parents almost made me cry <laughs> like Aww. it was i was like oh oh yeah that's why bullies are bullies i guess it was tough um, but it's that that's what I picture him. Like just that's look- how you're picturing cyborg <clears throat> yeah. sling working. Like he just looks around and there's just like there's literally just like screens of text messages all over the place. And he's just yeah. kind of like he has to focus on one to be able to do it. And hearing hearing a bunch of phone calls or hearing stuff like that, I'm sure he could, but it, it must be a jumbled mess. And I could see like looking around. A ra- if there's only one person in the room, there's just one like. And it's also like along those lines, we don't really see. Oh no! I will take the tinfoil hat for a second. Please we don't, because mine was garbage. We don't so please see cyborg in crowded area. We don't see Vic going into crowded areas with a lot of people and a lot of technology until the New Year's episode, where he gets knocked out in an alleyway by the father box trying to take control of him. That's the first time that we've seen him like in a city center where he would be in the vicinity of a lot of people. But even Other that, than that, he's always on yeah. the beach in Har- Happy Harbor or in the Premier Building, where Premier Building, pretty close to a lot of stuff, but he'd be like within like 10 people close range, so maybe only dealing with like five to 10 people close range. Yeah, 
But he was saying, like, I need my own room, right? And so even there, maybe he can try and focus on not looking at stuff. That's a really good point. And even that that area of town, I, I have the emotional memory of that area of town, like, being an abandoned, like, area of town where there's not much yeah. going on, which is why it took Forager or two days to find him, right? Yeah. So that's a really, really good point. Like, I could absolutely believe that Cyborg, once he started realizing, like, oh, this is a, a thing that is happening, was like, I'm going to not I'm go places not yeah. that have technology and people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's much less. But, you know, it just contributes to him feeling more and more isolated because he's not interacting with people or his friends and not going to events yeah. and stuff like that, which just contributes to his spiraling emotional state. Right. Which is then exacerbated by his powers. Uh, I refer you to... Uh, the AMV from our fan service because there's some well, really there you interesting go. points in we've, there too. We've come full circle. We have come full circle. And also you scout, you, you, you salvage the tinfoil hat. Thank you. I do my best. I'm almost embarrassed by my nonsense. All right. And with that, thank you for spending time with us, everyone. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ files on Facebook at crashing the mode on Tumblr at the YJ files and on our website, crashingthemode.com. If that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.